one of the most important you know things that he said was that it's a system where trust is not required like that's a fundamental basis to bitcoin right you don't need trust it was created in response to a failing system that's still failing same system we have today you know where government is constantly bailing out banks printing more money and so on and each downturn seems to get more aggressive until something maybe will completely and permanently break in the in the coming years in that clip you just heard zach herbert ceo of foundation devices that's who we're talking to today so you know what time it is what is up you beautiful people welcome back to the Built on Bitcoin podcast, where we cover all the innovation happening across the Bitcoin ecosystem, mostly talking to directly to the builders that are trying to expand the use cases of Bitcoin. And so that's who I have today talking with me. Zach Herbert is the CEO of Foundation Devices, where they build tools to help you be a sovereign individual. That's their entire thesis. They're a Bitcoin focused company. And they're trying to build hardware and software that makes it as easy as possible to custody your keys, keep yourself safe, and be sovereign. It's a, it's a very overarching theme, but if you check out their hardware, it looks fantastic and super easy to use. So really, really like what they're building. Had to get Zach on the pod to discuss what they're currently building uh, what fascinates him about Bitcoin, why he got into it, where they're going, a bunch of other topics. So this one was super, super interesting. I also love talking to people who are in the hardware space because there's a different kind of constraints to work around, which I find interesting. I was trying to learn. So yeah, without further ado, let's jump into this podcast. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. We all know Bitcoin is for the innovators, the revolutionaries, and the builders looking to build a better world for themselves and for the next generation. We also know the saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is right now. The same thing applies to building on Bitcoin. If you want to come build with the most active developer community building new use cases for Bitcoin, then it's time you make the leap to learning Clarity. Clarity is the stack's smart contract programming layer which enables us to work on DeFi, smart contracts, and so much more, all built with the safety and security that comes with Bitcoin. Start today by going to start.stacks.org. Start.stacks.org has a five-step journey that will take you from complete Stacks novice to teaching you clarity all the way to finding a job with a Web3 Stacks startup. Don't wait another month, year, or decade waiting to get involved in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Start building on Bitcoin today. Go to start.stacks.org to start learning and building today. Thank you to our sponsor. And now, without further ado, let's jump into this podcast episode with Zach Herbert, CEO of Foundation Devices. Welcome to Built on Bitcoin. Zach, how you doing, Dave, my man? Doing great. Good, good to have you here. Um, how you doing in the bear market, man? How how's it how's it feeling right now? I don't know. This is like my third bear market, so the honest answer is I don't really care too much about it. <laughs> um, that seems that seems common amongst. Once you've been through one cycle, you're just numb to the volatility ex- of it. Exactly. Just the volatility is part of the game right that's just what bitcoin is it's just you know like this up and down and so on yeah we're talking about bear market blues so yeah you just kind of you're, you're numb to the whole thing it's irrelevant it doesn't change your conviction of building one iota not at all if anything i think um it's kind of fun to see you know kind of the infighting and the and the drama and whatnot anytime there's a bear market it happens every single time and i think it's great because it's a little bit more quiet of a time to uh to build it just means that we have you know more time to spend getting you know things ready for the uh the next big uh, bull market and the next big influx of users right yeah Yeah. getting the tourists out uh in some sense and being able to have like a really high signal to noise ratio at first especially as a content creator i was like man it's so 
everything is down. Like no one wants to hear it. It <laughs> sucks. But now it's just like, no, nah, man, the people I'm talking to are super high caliber still. And the people who still listen, like those are the true, true fans. So it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, all I have time to do now is listen to podcasts, right? So <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, man, I'm excited to talk to you about what you guys are building. Um, you're building some hardware, which is interesting space. Um, comes with its own unique problems. But before we get into anything you guys are building, uh, everyone gets to Bitcoin different ways. And I keep asking this question, like what fascinates you about Bitcoin to every person? And I'm so intrigued by the the difference of answers across Bitcoin. So for you, what what is the thing that fascinates you so much about Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I think it's changed over time. So you asked me when I first got into it um, about nine years ago, it was more about just the uh, number go up, you know, like the in investment potential and having just a better form of money with that, you know, fixed supply that cannot change. And just kind of intuitively understanding that that makes sense where, okay, as more users come on board, then the value of, of that should go up, right? The value of each coin. So that was that was a while ago. But then what ends up happening, and I think it's like a, a typical journey that most people go through once you get into Bitcoin, is that you start to inundate yourself with all the content, you know, podcasts and blog posts and Twitter and Reddit and so on. And all of a sudden, in the last few years, I start to care a lot more about like the sovereignty angle, you know, the the idea of just having control over my own money, uh, which is probably the most important thing uh, about not needing to depend on any any third party and, and about how that um, kind of permeates like your entire life, where once you start to take sovereignty over your own money, you start to say, okay, well, what about like my data, my identity, and then even things outside of like digital sovereignty, like food and, you know, other stuff, right? Like that. And so it's definitely become much more of like a, um, like a digital sovereignty uh, angle for me. And and that's, I think what I care about the most. And it's, it's so interesting when I look back, you know, how, how that's changed for me over time, going more from like the NGU to, to the sovereignty. Right. Did you, so, so am I right to assume then that Bitcoin maybe had you grow your own garden? Like you're now food sovereign <laughs> and you got tomatoes in the backyard? Not yet. We just bought a house. So, uh, it's coming. so we will do all that, but more like, you know, like we did a, we did a collaboration. We sponsored like the beef initiative where they've done some cool conferences, like educating ranchers about Bitcoin and I'm ordering from, you know, ordering meat directly from the, uh, you know, the, the ranchers in Texas that accept Bitcoin, you know, through the beef initiative or, um, you know, getting my uh, food deliveries from the Amish now and getting the raw milk and whatnot. So maybe, maybe I've gone a little too, you know, <laughs> too far, but, um, I think it's one of those things where like, I could, I couldn't have imagined that like maybe five, five years ago, like it's, it's kind of hilarious to think about how starting with the money, it kind of permeated every other aspect <laughs> of my life yeah it's it's and when you use this word clown world and it's mm -hmm. kind of like a you know it's like a gut punch thing like how crazy is the outside world but yeah it's said tongue-in-cheek but what they mean is like once you see the world through a bitcoin lens everything else changes and it's hard to unsee it and and so you're just like I don't understand why you guys are doing that. Your actions don't make sense. Like you should know better. And it's right. It's it's weird disconnect between like there's these silos of knowledge in some sense, and then through that knowledge you view the world, um, right. and it changes all your downstream actions from that. Yeah, there's that meme, you know, fix the money, fix the world, and yeah. everyone that doesn't like Bitcoin, anytime Bitcoin drops or anytime something you know, bad happens in the world. They like tag, they're like, Hey, Bitcoiners, like explain how Bitcoin fixes this. And I do think though, that, you know, once you really start to understand how important money is as a foundation for everything in society, you start to realize that if you have broken money. Um, everything in society starts to break. You know, you don't, you don't have an accurate, um, 
you know, interest rate, right? Cost of capital, all that basic stuff that acts as an input to like everything in civilization. You look at everything going on in the world and you think, wow, like all these actions from these uh, central banks and cent- very centralized governments are just typically making things worse. <laughs> and and so that that culture in Bitcoin of saying, you know, get the humans out of these decisions, you know, set the rules and then get out of the way so that, you know, people can just work within the rules of the monetary system. And there's no way to change those rules, right? Uh, you, you all of a sudden want that for like everything. And yeah, I mean, that was not something that I thought about, you know, 10 years ago, like that was something that you, you start to read the all the different books, like the Bitcoin standard, you listen to podcasts like Tales from the Crypt, I think was a really influential one for me. Um, and you really start to just consume all this uh, information. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Like I've been here a year now, maybe a mm-hmm. year and a year and four months. I'm still, this is my first cycle. Oh, congratulations. Um, first bear thank market. You. Yeah, I'm, get, <laughs> I'm getting the scars. I'm feeling stronger day by day. Yeah. Um, but I was just talking to someone and we were talking about like the homeless crisis, which is kind of across America and so many big cities. Mm-hmm. And then we were kind of talking about, and I typically come from more of like a capitalist point of view in the positive. So like it's value for value exchange. It's not like the stealing and the capital accumulation per se. And other people come from the more like socialist or government point of view. And we're, we're talking about like what starts first. Is it mental health kind of thing with, with homelessness or, Is it something else? And my point of view is kind of like when the money's broken, everything starts to go crazy. So housing prices go crazy. You can't, you don't have good price signals. Maybe regulation Mm -hmm. creeps in. So you can't get enough new houses built, which makes things cascade down because higher tier buyers will buy these lower tier houses. And so that cascades until the person who would work at Wendy's and afford a two bedroom apartment literally can't. And they just go to other things for like, Mm -hmm exhaust valves to like escape how hard life is and so even from that lens it's like you think it's just mental health or something like that or like a lack of safety nets but it could just be the base level thing that helps us navigate and transact in the world is broken and everything else kind of breaks from that but it's like there's yeah very divergent views totally i mean i just saw an article this week about how it costs 1.7 million dollars to build a public bathroom now and I think San Francisco or somewhere in California. Wow. Like a like I think like a one stall public bathroom. And you're just like, this is this is insane. Everything and of course there's obviously all the government, I think, regulation and and all that. But yeah, I think what you said is accurate. Like if you don't have good money, um just ev- everything, you know, everything breaks. And then, you know, the more you print the more it benefits things like uh, stocks and real estate and so on. And if you own that, then you're happy almost, right? I mean, look at what's happening every time the Fed announces another interest rate hike, you know, uh, if it's higher than expected, right, the stock market goes down. Uh, if, If they think that, you know, if the inflation report comes out and inflation is higher than expected, stock market goes down because now they know that the Fed is going to have to keep hiking even more. It's just so obvious. It's like insane. And then it gets to the point where, you know, your house is an investment vehicle, not a house, and then you can't afford it. And then you just all these cascading, you know, effects. And it's just kind of crazy to think how much of that does stem from the money. So I am, I am a believer in that silly meme, you know, fix the money, (laughs) fix the world. Right. Right. Yeah. As much as much as it feels, it's kind of like a crazy utopian view almost. But it's, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's right, and it's it, it continues to strike me how beautiful Bitcoin is and its design. Because and I think Spyro posted something yesterday about like banks need your money, um, something something Bitcoin doesn't. It's it just is. Mm-hmm. It's worded better, but the idea is like when you hold a proper hardware wallet, you are the bank in this like ethereal global substrate if you will like i need to put better words behind it but like you don't have to store it anywhere else you just have the keys and you can plug it into the cloud in some sense and you can pull it out whenever you need and that idea is so counter to anything else that we have yeah and you have this when you go to your website the first thing it says in big bold letters become a sovereign individual (laughs) yeah and that's and that's 
I'd love to just explore that in that context, though, like for people sure. just to drive that home of like Bitcoin is this crazy global thing that whenever you want to, you can just pluck out your money when right. needed and it helps you be sovereign in a global sense. What does becoming a sovereign individual look like for you? Maybe through the lens of foundation, how you guys view it. Yeah. And um, firstly, I mean, the term sovereign individual came from a very, very uh, good book called the sovereign individual. So we didn't invent that term or anything. So highly recommend it. Everyone read it or at least skim it. It's pretty dense. <laughs> um, in a predi- it was written a couple decades ago or a few decades ago, uh, I think in the beginning of the rise of the internet and it predicted the rise of digital currencies and, and uh, the, the declining power of centralized governments and things like digital nomadism and uh, all that stuff. So firstly, it's a very cool book. In, in terms of like, you know, as you said, it, with Bitcoin, it's like your 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 money is actually yours and it's available to you whenever you want it and you don't need to trust anyone. And I think it's really important to remember if you're if you're into Bitcoin, if you consider yourself a Bitcoiner, if you're working in the space, if you run a company in the space, it's important to remember like why Bitcoin was created and what you know why it exists and what Satoshi said about it, you know, in the early days. I mean, one of the most important you know, things that he said was that it's a system where trust is not required. Like that's a fundamental basis to Bitcoin, right? You don't need trust. It it was created in response to a failing system that's still failing, same system we have today, um, you know, where government is constantly bailing out banks, printing more money and so on. And each downturn seems to get more aggressive until something maybe will completely and permanently break in the, in the coming years. So, you know, one of the reasons why we started foundation, uh, back in, uh, March, April of 2020, um, was because like, I, I was a personally frustrated at how difficult it was to use like existing, hardware wallets or other, you know, wallets or tools to take self-custody, you know, sovereignty of of my Bitcoin. But also that so much of the investment, I feel like, in the whole cryptocurrency space was flowing into like a more custodial type projects and, and providers. And I think this has changed a little bit in the last couple of years. But if you think about like, or if you go look back at all the different kind of funding announcements in 2019, 2018, uh, maybe maybe most of that 2019 and into 2020, a lot of like exchanges, you know, uh, it was a huge source of of uh, like venture capital dollars, um, custodial type uh, nodes and other offerings like cloud nodes, hosted nodes, all that kind of stuff. It was very rare to see any kind of company pursuing self custody or sovereignty, or I think it's changed a bit now with like all the different DeFi stuff going on and all the kind of quote unquote web three and all that. So I think the, the, where the money's flowing has changed, but I think it's just like, we, we had this strong desire to um, build products that enable people to actually achieve digital sovereignty. And the best analogy is to compare it to, you know, like being able to have like a, an ounce of gold, a gold bar that you keep at home, right? Like under your bed or something or in a safe. That's the closest, I think, analogy towards storing your own Bitcoin, right? But you you can you can use a software wallet or a hardware wallet or even just an old laptop, you know, and and store your own keys uh and and therefore be your own bank without needing to trust anyone. And you can store ten dollars worth of bitcoin on there you could store ten million dollars worth of bitcoin on there and it's in the same size device no matter how much you store right a little different from gold which is pretty cool and you can actually have real sovereignty and so like our challenge and what i'm excited about is being able to you know build products that give you a fantastic user experience while still allowing you to have that digital sovereignty. And more specifically, that means like not only storing your own keys, which is important, but also having control over all aspects of your digital life and having privacy. Because I would also argue like if you store your money, like if you store your keys yourself, but there's another company that knows exactly like your name, your address, 
what your balance is in terms of like your what you're storing in the wallet. You sure you store your own keys, but someone can come knock on your door, you know, 10 years down the line. You know, government can come knock on your door and say, you know, we're taking your Bitcoin, which did happen with gold, you know, many decades ago. So it's really important like to think about your entire like digital sovereignty stack and 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 not just storing your own keys, but like how you store that to make sure you do it in like a in a privacy preserving way. And and that's been inaccessible really for most people to date. And so we're trying to make that uh, more accessible. Perfect. And that's the good way to kind of continue on that. As you said, it is make it more accessible where it's, mm-hmm. I'm hearing, I'm hearing different things and I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm, you know, you're making hardware. And so mm-hmm. you have ledger and Trezor, and mm-hmm. I just got a ledger. It's pretty good. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and I've, I've heard of coin join services and this mm-hmm. kind of stuff, but I don't really never use them. Don't really know what they do behind the scenes. Maybe I guess I don't have to. That's kind of the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but is that is that what you saw as the big missing piece in the market is that they're the the underlying pieces are starting to come online they're mm-hmm. relatively there but no one's put them into like a i don't mean like a coin based package in the sense that it's just easy to use like you go to one place and it's just like we give you all the tools without having to uh be centralized but it's right. ver- vertically integrated uh, and you can do all the things that help you reach that sovereign life. That is that kind of where you guys are in, like the the white space, or yeah. I mean, I I think the way the way I look at it is kind of what you said. Where I think most of the tools exist today in some form. Um, you, know, you go buy a hardware wallet. You, know, you could buy a hardware wallet before we, as a company, you know, got started. Um, you can use different kinds of privacy tools, whether that's like bitcoin specific like like coin join like samurai whirlpool is a good example or it could be outside bitcoin it could be like a vpn or tor right like uh a vpn was something that was not very common 10 years ago and now all of a sudden it's like everywhere to the point where apple integrated like some type of vpn into ios into their icloud service and so I think the way we look at what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring all of these tools, these these digital sovereignty tools to the next wave of adopters, right? Is is kind of is I think that's that's the way I really look at it. Where something like setting up a ledger device, if you're totally new to the space, is still really hard. I think like the the hardware form factor is unintuitive for a lot of people, the screen size, the tiny buttons. But then also just the onboarding experience of, you know, needing to deal with seed words and so on. So like even with our, our passport hardware wallet today, uh, you can still do seed words if you want. But by default, we do like an encrypted micro SD backup because we think for a lot of people when they're just getting started for the first time, they don't really know what these seed words represent and they don't really fully understand how to safeguard them. And what ends up happening is they get like fished or something with an you know, online attack. They get tricked to entering their seed words like into a computer. They don't really you know. know. Uh, and then you lose all your money. And so I think there's a few things. I think there's like the hardware form factors are difficult. I still think a lot of like the software wallets are really difficult to use. Um, a lot of, especially when you do anything privacy related, there's a lot of terminology that's like completely new that you have to learn and understand. Um, and then also I just have a gripe around how so many of the tools like Ledger are closed source. And like, we're really big believers in open source software. We think like an open source, uh, these all these open, you know, protocols and, and, and stuff like that, uh, like an open internet should run on a foundation of open hardware. And so it, it kind of bothers me when you have this fundamental foundational hardware that's like storing your keys and it's, and it's closed source. So I think we're just trying to make it much more usable and, and trying to bring it together, like you said, in more of an integrated experience where ideally, instead of having to use several different uh, tools, you know, hardware, software, and so on, ideally we can get that all integrated into like a single product suite. And it's all making like the best decisions by default for you when it comes to your digital sovereignty. And so for example, you know, our Envoy mobile app, which is like a, our passport companion app, you know, it guides you through setting up the hardware and 
gives you a basic Bitcoin software wallet, you know, to go with your hardware wallet uh, that connects to the internet over Tor by default. So you can turn that off. You know, you could you could decide to not use that, but we're trying to encourage really great defaults for user privacy, right? And so we don't know the user's IP address. We don't know the balance of Bitcoin that you have on the device or anything like that. Um, and that's so important. You know, usually you have to make a trade-off. Like usually you're you're making a trade-off between like easy to use or like custodial or not private or something like that. So we're trying to say, okay, like let's get rid of these trade-offs or may, or at least provide a different set of trade-offs, right? Where it's it's easy to use, but we make these default really great decisions where you don't have to think too much. If you use a product from foundation, you don't have to be like, well, like am I compromising on like my privacy? You know, am I am I trusting them with anything? Like we're trying to make it where the answer is no. Like you just have this great experience and and we're making sure that you know you're able to achieve that digital sovereignty. Perfect. You got me hyped right now. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm signing up. Uh for people that are hearing that then and they and they're intrigued, what is the things that you offer? You you have a hardware wallet and doesn't look like most hardware wallets. It almost looks like a like a sexy Nokia phone from the early yeah. 2000s. <laughs> uh, and then you have some software, but what's the suite of tools that you guys currently have on? on yeah, on the so roster? it's pretty simple right now. So we have a hardware wallet called Passport. It's a Bitcoin only device. I would call it, you know, best in class Bitcoin hardware wallet um, on every dimension from the physical design, the usability of a nice larger bright, you know, color IPS display, you know, laminated to glass, a uh, really beautiful user interface. We actually uh, use a camera and QR codes for the primary communication. So it's air gapped in the sense that it doesn't have any Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, no USB data or anything like that. So the way you do transactions is you just scan some QR codes back and forth, whether it's your phone or your computer. Uh, we have our own mobile app called Envoy that goes with that. Uh, you could do the whole onboarding for Passport, the setup, firmware updates, and so on from the mobile app. So you don't even need to go to your computer for the initial setup. And then you could choose to use our Envoy app as like your Bitcoin software wallet companion. But we're also compatible with virtually every popular Bitcoin software wallet today on desktop or mobile. So that could be Blue Wallet. You know, if you're using Blue Wallet, you can just link your Passport to that and have a hardware wallet right on you know, right in Blue Wallet and the interface that you can move money to and from. Uh, Casa, you know, you can you can use something like Casa and link Passport to it. Uh, popular desktop wallets, whether it's Bitcoin Core, Sparrow, Spectre, a bunch of other things, even like BTC Pay. So we maintain, I think, really strong compatibility with, you know, every popular Bitcoin software wallet in the space. But that, that's what we have today. We have, we have Passport and we have Envoy that requires that you uh, use Passport with it. Um, in the future, over the next several months, I think you'll see us building out the mobile app side more, where the mobile app Envoy is actually also a standalone hot wallet, and we'll continuously add more interesting features to that to help make you, you know, more uh, more sovereign. Um, so, so you know, the roadmap uh, we we started off with just hardware, and now the roadmap is very much like the hardware and software kind of side by side. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. I love to explore this idea of like the hardware wallet too and how you see it because um, I, I like the scanning portion of it as, mm -hmm. as a, a form function is becoming more and more common and usable. Like mm -hmm. people just get used to it. Um, but even like this common thing is like I had a friend who was locked out of his account recently because he didn't save his authenticator, whatever, mm -hmm. and then change phones. And he's like, what do you mean I got to type in this random code? Mm -hmm. this Chain. I don't know what this is. And I was like, bro, I thought that was common knowledge. Like it's, all, <laughs> it's authenticated. We're not talking about like secret keys and stuff right now. Um yeah. so it's it's still I, I dance between like there's a future as the the tech matures look more like I'll carry my phone and a passport in my pocket as I go about my day, or <laughs> or does my spending money sit on my phone and I Apple Pay? BTC most of the time. Like, what? How do you see that kind of dance of, uh, like, really putting the sovereign tech at the forefront, and I carry the device mm -hmm. versus like ease of use is always kind of that battle. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, 
outside of what, like, if you put aside what, what we're doing, right. And you kind of look at where things are going. I think like we're, we're headed in this direction where Apple and Google keep bringing like more and more of that control into their respective ecosystems. So like Apple is just rolling out this new standard called pass keys that Google is also going to be supporting. It's an open standard actually, which is cool, which means we can, we can tap into it in the future, but you know, as, as something to replace the password and, and then most people are doing 2FA, right? Like whether it's uh, YubiKeys as separate devices or whether it's like Google Authenticator style, like the six digit, you know, one-time uh, one time codes uh, that are so common. Most people are having those like on their, on their phones, like Google Authenticator app on your phone. So it's kind of weird because it's like your phone is like your primary computing device. And then your 2FA is also an app on your phone. Like it feels like maybe it should be a separate device or something like that. And then in Bitcoin or crypto world, you have these hardware wallets that do get this the important keys off the phone, off the computer, so that you can, you know, uh, app- sign these transactions and you know confirm these transactions on a separate dedicated device. As of right now, I don't think the idea of like portability is something that anyone in the in the space is really pursuing. I feel like most of these hardware wallets today are something that you um, you keep in your drawer or safety deposit box or something like that. And then any day-to-day transacting you would do with like a smaller, you know, like a, like a wallet on your phone that has like a, a smaller amount, you know, of Bitcoin or, or crypto or, or whatever. Uh, so I think that's where we're headed now, like based on everything going on today. We at Foundation are looking closely at kind of the idea of, you know, can you bring more into the hardware wallet? Right. And that's why we called it Passport. Even though it started as just the Bitcoin mm-hmm. hardware wallet, I think we're really interested in in being able to secure your entire digital life with the hardware wallet. And there's a lot of competing standards that we're going to see over the coming years for like signing into things with your private keys, right? Like private keys as identity. And there's there's standards on Bitcoin, like uh, using like Paynim, which is like a username that like the Samurai ecosystem uses, where you can use that to sign in like as one click sign on. Uh, there's some Lightning standards where you can actually sign in with like your your Lightning wallet or your Lightning node acts as like your authentication where you send like a one sat payment, you know, and that logs you into whatever app or service. There's like competing stuff. Like I just mentioned Apple and Google with these pass keys. So I think we're going to see a lot of competition over the next few years for like authentication. And what what we really want to do is allow you to like ideally authenticate with like your, like your Bitcoin keys in some way to actually do login and then also allow users to do like multi-factor authentication, you know, with their, uh, with their hardware wallet or some other kind of device that's not part of the Apple, Google you know, ecosystem, right? Get your most important stuff off your phone and, 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 you know, essentially don't depend on like, you know, Apple or Google's more proprietary type standards where you're having to trust them with everything. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. I like the passport name now where it's like, yeah, I got my phone. It's everything I need, but then like, I also got my left pocket, my passport that lets me into all of my most important well, things in life. Yeah, it's funny though. Portability is a tough one and it's something we're looking closely at. Like Passport today is is not really designed as that portable device. Um, it can be. I mean, I, I mean, I always have one in my bag anyway, right? And it's kind of funny when you go through a TSA or whatever, they think it's like an <laughs> old phone. They don't know it's like a, like a hardware wallet, right? But um, I think that, you know, there's things we can do to make to make a device that's deliberately more portable in the future. And so we're looking closely at that. Um, but uh, that's probably all I'll say for now. <laughs> TBD, to, we'll, yeah. do, we'll do it for round two next oh, year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Then a um, couple more questions. We, we breezed through a half hour. This has been fantastic so far. <laughs> but uh, most people build software. And mm-hmm. you know, software is infinitely scalable. And it's easier to build in some sense. Uh, what's been the biggest difficulties of getting 
this off the ground and building hardware, especially like super private, secure. Like I, I'm sure you have supply chain issue things, not just from like getting pieces, but like security stuff. Like I'm just curious about the, the whole space. Yeah, not as much on the security side because we do manufacture in the US and we are like on the ground at the manufacturer when we're building. And so I don't think we face the same security related challenges as we would if we like had it made in China or something. Like that would be a problem. I would never buy a hardware wallet that's like made in China, you know, by some random uh, manufacturer. So not as much on the security side, but we've definitely struggled with a like the just the supply chain crisis going on, like things taking longer to come in. We actually had a lot of issues um, with like the COVID shutdowns in China. Cause even though we don't manufacture in China, a lot of the parts come from China. It's really hard to even get like really high quality, like consumer grade plastic or metal from the U S like most of the companies in the U S that are built, that are doing like plastic injection molding, are doing it more for like medical or government type use or military type use. And so the aesthetics, like the perfect aesthetics, the perfect like surface finish and something that you'd expect, like if you buy a product from Apple, like you don't really have those core capabilities stateside as much. It's much harder to find. It's much more expensive. So, you know, we went with the path of like, okay, we have the plastic molded in China. we got the metal casted in China. We'll just ship it here. Right. And we'll, we'll, we'll do all the, vinyl assembly here. And that I think was, I don't think we can do that again because we got hit with a lot of delays earlier this year when we we're bringing Passport Batch 2 to market because the supplier was like, okay, like, or, you know, we're, we're shutting down. We're doing a COVID shutdown. We're going to be gone, down for like three, four weeks, which is crazy, you know, as we're trying to plan yeah. out the supply chain and, and try to manufacture. So we faced a lot of delays this year from that. And then also actually just more struggling from like normal hardware startup type stuff, which is, you know, establishing that great that supply chain of great of great suppliers that are very detail oriented and quality control oriented and so on where like we want to try to get that keypad feel to be like absolutely perfect or we want the plastic to look absolutely perfect and we've come a long way especially since our founders edition passport founders edition last year where we did like about a thousand of those devices like if you look at that one compared to what we're shipping now huge improvement i don't think we're there yet i think by next year We'll, we'll hopefully be much closer to like uh, Apple quality. Um, but yeah, I mean, hardware is hard and it's it's usually the stuff that you don't expect. Like I didn't expect these types of delays from suppliers or QC challenges. Um, but, uh, you know, we just kind of build the muscle internally. Cool. And when you say batch two because mm-hmm. that that word to me seems like this is like a production batch but you're yeah. also doing this is like the best of what we're currently building with updates and that as well it's not just like a, a yeah. new production run i think we're probably going to call it end up calling it like uh when we keep selling on our website like passport like gen two right because mm-hmm. we have gen one from last year which was our founders edition we called it passport founders edition where it was we numbered each unit, you know, like by out of a thousand. So you get like number 400 out of a thousand or whatever. And we lasered that onto the back meant to be more of like a collector's type edition and like the first device that we made. And now we're doing passport batch two, but I think it's really just, we're going to be calling it like passport, right? So you'll see passport like uh, parentheses gen two. And uh, when you go to our website to buy, you know, later this year, early next year, once we sell out of our batch two, it'll just be like buy a passport. And we'll just have it in stock. So that was the other thing. Like we had to do pre-orders when we were getting started for the first time. Now we're, you know, better capitalized. We've come a long way. So we're going to be moving away from this pre-order model to just like, you know, go on our website and buy it. Right. Which for most things you buy is that's how it works. But for like an early stage startup, I think it's a nice milestone to be able to move away from like the pre-order model to the actually like, yep, we have units in stock. You can buy one. It'll ship same week to you and so on. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm uh I'm gonna have to pick one up ASAP. Are you guys <laughs> are you guys gonna stay? Are you Bitcoin focused solely? Um, I think we've seen Ledger go like even to NFTs and stuff, which you know, some peers have been like, that's a little too extreme, but they see mm-hmm. it like all digital assets, digital assets. What, what, how do you guys view that? The way we describe ourselves is we were a Bitcoin centric company, or I've been even using the term like Bitcoin centric sovereignty company or even just digital sovereignty 
company. So in terms of like our company values, Bitcoin is absolutely at the core. What I've seen from like some of the other companies in the space like Ledger is that they kind of run around tra- uh, chasing the latest trend. And so this year it's, or in the last year it's NFTs. Before that it was other stuff. And they're always running around kind of looking at the latest trend and doing aggressive like social media marketing towards that and setting up things like they announced, I think several months ago, like an NFT marketplace or that kind of thing. I look at that as distraction personally. I look at that as like, you have to have your core focus as a company, especially us, because we're so small, you know, we're about two and a half years old and have only been shipping uh, shipping hardware for um, maybe like 15 or 16 months total, right? So I don't even think you've been shipping hardware for a year and a half yet. So that focus is really important. Um, I think you'll see that we maintain this, this Bitcoin centric approach, but we are very interested in pursuing products that provide a full stack, like sovereignty experience for the end user. And so that's probably all I'll say on that, but I think we will be moving beyond even Bitcoin and crypto to thinking about all the different tools that you need to become, you know, a sovereign individual and trying to bring that all into the same um, experience. Very cool. Okay. Foundation's a place to watch for damn sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have this awesome team, you know, we just, we've been hiring. So uh, we went from 12 of us, you know, three, four months ago to now we're about to be 17, which is crazy. We were like fully like every single discipline internally, everything from mechanical engineering to industrial design to digital design, low level firmware, where we could do like operating system type work all the way up the stack to like mobile apps and doing all the supply chain and sourcing internally, electrical engineering and circuit board design internally. So we have like a really multidisciplinary, really strong team. And yeah, I mean, I think we're we're hopefully going to be doing a lot of cool stuff over the next uh, couple of years and beyond. I love it. I love it. Well, I think uh, last question, I like to end on like a philosophical note in some sense. And so, you know, you guys are building hardware, you're building that foundation, trying to help the sovereign individual. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking like five years from now, let's imagine, <laughs> let's, and that's like insane in, in Bitcoin crypto times, but let's say Bitcoin's like, I don't even know what's what's reasonable anymore. Like half a million, a million a coin. Five so, five years? Oh, like at least like two million. Okay. Two million. So we'll use <laughs> call, that. Call it call it two million a coin. Yeah. We'll say so it's at like two million. People are are the market cap is some crazy number higher than this because of that. People are buying in like crazy. Where does how do you see that future of Bitcoin? And where does where does an ideal like foundation future fit into the two million Bitcoin land in five years? Well, what I really hope is that the majority of users will be storing their own keys at that point. Mm. Cause I don't think that's not the world we live in today. Right. So I really do think that the space is at like an inflection point right now because we're in, we're in bear market and we just had a big influx of users when, you know, we went to like 70, 70 K, right. Like we had a, had a big influx of users and we're obviously still have users coming in, right? You look at some of the data and you're like, this is great. Like the space is growing, but next bull market, whether that's next year or two to four years from now, um, there's going to be a huge influx in users. And if the self-custody and sovereignty experience is not like as easy to use as Coinbase is just kind of, I mean, you brought up Coinbase earlier. I think it is a good analogy, right? Like if the self-custody experience is not as easy as Coinbase, you're going to have, I think most of those new users go to Coinbase or equivalent. And that's just, to me, that's, that's really bad because, because I think the more valuable Bitcoin gets, the more pressure is on governments and other parties, you know, the entrenched kind of, uh, the, the the current power, people in power, right? Whether that's the banking system, you know, governments and so on, the whole fiat monetary system, it's going to be fighting against Bitcoin. I don't think we're going to have an easy time over the next decade. Um, and so I hope that we can have a serious impact in getting people to, you know, take custody over their own coins and 
and do so in a, in a privacy preserving way so that we don't run into the same, you know, stuff that happened decades ago with gold and, you know, with the U S government, you know, telling everyone you have to, you have to turn in your gold, right? We don't, we don't want any situation where anyone could go door to door with a list of all the Bitcoin holders and how much money they have, or, or just go to Coinbase and say, Hey, we're seizing all your, all your money. We're seizing all your Bitcoin. Like we want to create a situation where it's so decentralized, where everyone has that baseline level of digital sovereignty, where, you know, we help Bitcoin ultimately win because Bitcoin demand being very at a very high price per coin, but in my opinion, it still loses if it's become part of like the traditional financial system. If it's primarily on exchanges, if it's rehypothecated, right? Meaning that you know, uh, for every one Bitcoin that uh, that you have, maybe it's uh, maybe that Bitcoin is on an exchange, but it's being you know uh, it's fractional reserve essentially Bitcoin, right? So we, we we don't want that kind of situation, right? We don't want it to be kind of co-opted by the existing financial system, the banking system. We want it to be fully decentralized money so it can achieve its its actual original mission. And I hope that foundation can play an enormous role in that, you know, in the coming years. Perfect. That's a beautiful way to end it. I, I couldn't agree <laughs> more. I think that the yeah. I, I I'll send my friends like Bitcoin via Cash App. Just because it's like, oh yeah, I eat ten bucks for dinner, and they'll be like, what, "Where's my cash?" I'm like, "It's in your other thing. You got to move it over." But even that's too cumbersome for them. So the, I think the fight for the UI ease of use, it's a big fight. But I'm glad companies like yours are doing what they can to make it as easy as possible. Uh, yeah. So appreciate you coming on. Where where can people find out more about Foundation or Copa Passport if they want to? Yeah, just uh, check us out on FoundationDevices.com. And uh, have a lot of have a lot of good content there, and uh, you can find us on Twitter, obviously, and uh, we have a Telegram group and so on. So feel free to come, give us a follow, ask us any questions. Perfect, Zach. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. All right. Boom. <laughs>